time. The early 2000s were an interesting time for television. And 2001 saw the launch of perhaps the most insane television show of them all, with the NBC premiere of Fear Factor. Fear Factor pitted contestants against each other in a series of intense stunts and physical and mental challenges. It was brutal, it was terrifying, and it was designed to push contestants to their breaking point. The perfect idea for a theme park attraction. And so four years later, the TV show would be brought to Universal Studios as a live show, making park guests dangle from suspended cars, plunge into tanks of eels, and eat raw insects, all while enjoying their Florida vacation. So let's take a look at the history of Fear Factor Live and ask, who let this happen? In the year 2000, American television network NBC had a problem. In the summer, when most scripted TV shows took a season break, its competing networks had been running incredibly popular reality TV to fill the void. CBS had just launched a new hit island survival show named Survivor, and at the same time, ABC had been running their own hit quiz show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? But what did NBC have? Dateline? Dateline? And CBS made NBC's problem even worse when later that year they also launched Big Brother. It was clear that NBC needed their own competition show too. And thankfully for them, there seemed to be a pretty obvious formula for how to do it. All of these were American adaptations of popular foreign shows. Survivor from Sweden, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire from the UK, and Big Brother from the Netherlands. All you had to do was go to Europe, borrow a popular show, and rake in the cash. And so NBC did just that, picking the Dutch TV show Now or Neverland, and rechristening it Fear Factor. Fear Factor premiered on American television in the summer of 2001, presented by comedian Joe Rogan. I wonder what he's up to these days. Each episode would invite six contestants, three men and three women, to compete in three extreme challenges, each designed to make them face their biggest fears. If a contestant lost a challenge, backed out, or failed to complete it, they would be eliminated, with the winner at the end of the episode taking the grand prize. Just like Survivor, which offered a grand prize of a million dollars, or Big Brother, which offered $500,000, or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which offered a million dollars, Fear Factor would offer the winner of the show a cash prize of $50,000. Okay, a lot less than ABC or CBS, but this was given out every week. The first challenge would be a physical stunt, like jumping between two moving trucks, or jumping between two moving boats, or jumping between two buildings. Really, a lot of jumping between things. The second challenge would be a gross-out challenge, usually involving eating some sort of disgusting food like goat's eyeballs, or having insects crawl all over you. And the third challenge would be a final, much more intense stunt, this time a direct competition to decide the winner of the episode. Fear Factor was initially met with very negative reviews from critics, considering it an example of the worst of reality television. Writing for Variety, critic Michael Speyer wrote, It's long been a joke that execs will not rest until someone dies on a television show. If this debut is any sign, that might very well happen. But viewers were hooked, as Fear Factor carved out a regular spot at the top of the summer's ratings, alongside shows like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Tuesday Edition. Later that year, the show was renewed for a second season, introducing even more outrageous stunts. The third season of the show saw special episodes filmed around Las Vegas landmarks, and the fourth season introduced a couples format. And around the time of the show's fifth season, NBC purchased film company Universal, merging the two. With this, NBC now had access to a new method of promoting their TV shows, theme parks, and they were keen to bring their shows to the existing Universal Studios parks in both Florida and Hollywood, to give the general public a chance to experience the magic of television. And what was more magical than a tub full of worms? And so, in 2005, Universal Studios would seek to bring the Fear Factor experience to the general public. In January of 2005, Universal Studios Hollywood opened Fear Factor Live at the Castle Theatre, 
replacing the combination musical and stunt show Spider-Man Rocks. The same Fear Factor show would also open in June of 2005 at Universal Studios Florida, over there replacing the Wild 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 West stunt show. Both shows would follow the same format, with relatively minor differences between the two, and both would focus on the same key element guest participation. Because four years on from the debut of the hit NBC show, Universal Studios invited park guests to participate in the competition themselves, in a theme park. Guest participation has always been a big part of theme park shows, but Fear Factor Live really took this concept to strange new places. Because unlike a traditional stunt show where guests would be invited to try out the low risk parts of the performance, like being extras in Indiana Jones, or trying out the RC car at Lights Motors Action, Fear Factor Live made guests do all of the stunts. Guests wishing to participate were invited to attend the casting desk outside the theater 70 minutes before the show. Among many requirements, you had to be at least 18, between 5 foot and 6 foot 2, and between 110 and 225 pounds. During the casting process, guests were also shown a brief video about the stunts they would be expected to perform, quizzed about whether they'd drunk any alcohol that day, and made to sign a waiver. Universal would then seek to narrow down the number of participants by quickly assessing volunteers' physical abilities, as well as their willingness to perform in front of a crowd, through a game of Simon Says. Simon Says, dance around like a pretty princess ballerina. <laughs> nice. After this, six contestants would be selected and taken backstage to prepare. Backstage, they would be taken to a recording booth behind the theatre to film a brief introduction to be used at the start of the show, stating their name, where they're from, and why they think they're going to win. Hey, I'm Tom. I'm from England. I'm gonna win because I rock. Then they're fitted into their gear, red spandex, arm and knee braces, and a safety harness, before finally they're ready for the show. Let's take a look at the Orlando version of the show first. The amphitheater for the show was located in the World Expo part of Universal Studios, next to Men in Black Alien Attack. Inside, the show's background set was designed to look like an industrial city back alley, the buildings of the set being recycled from the former Wild West stunt show, redecorated to fit the new theme, and slightly modified to allow for more easily climbable sections. The show described itself as a special live edition of the real Fear Factor show, and so much like several similar shows, Fear Factor Live featured a camera operator and a producer, who would provide a pre-show for the audience. The producer would introduce the concept of the show and seek volunteers to play minor roles. They would also introduce a line they wanted the audience to say whenever a twist was announced in the show. There's, yeah, there's one, one more, more thing. thing. A line that was never said with any sort of enthusiasm by the audience, ever. Once these volunteers had been selected, the main show would begin with a video introduction from the host, a Joe Rogan stand-in saying the opening lines from the TV show. The host would then appear on the catwalk above the stage and introduce the contestants. As the contestants were sent off to await the first challenge, their video introductions they had shot earlier would play on the big screen. Fear Factor Live's first challenge was the endurance hang. For this, contestants had to hang from a set of handlebars suspended 35 feet above the ground for as long as possible. The handlebars were angled downwards to make holding onto them more difficult, and the first two contestants to lose their grip would be eliminated from the competition. But there was one, one more, more thing. thing. Because 15 seconds into the endurance hang, one of the audience volunteers would activate a set of industrial strength fans, to try and knock the contestants off. Although in reality, these fans were not that strong, and all they did was give the contestants air conditioning. Once the endurance hang was completed, the four remaining contestants would move on to the second challenge. And while this was being set up, another audience volunteer would be brought up to the front of the stage for a mini challenge named the Desert Hat Ordeal. Said to be reminiscent of the times when people were buried up to their necks in sand and left for dead in the desert, the audience volunteer would be strapped into a chair, unable to move, and have a box placed around their head. Another volunteer, typically a friend of the first, 
would then spin a large wheel which would determine which of a set of dangerous animals would be placed in the box on their partner's head. These were scorpions, snakes, spiders, and cockroaches. Although none of this mattered at all, because it would always be scorpions. For the second challenge, the remaining four competitors were split into pairs for the eel tank relay. This was a beanbag relay, where one competitor had to retrieve the beanbags from a tank filled with carnivorous eels, and toss them into a bucket held by their partner. For the second half of the challenge, they would be suspended in the air, and similarly have to toss beanbags into a bucket. But of course, there's, there's one, one more thing. <laughs> because the beanbags had now been replaced by rancid octopus? and they were tossed directly towards the audience. I'm not aware of any time where these were accidentally flung into the crowd, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happened at least once. The losing team would be eliminated, and the winners would then face off against each other in the grand final. And in the meantime, the second mini challenge would take place. Four more audience volunteers would compete in a mini challenge named Guess What's Crawling to Dinner. For this, they would have to race against each other to drink a blended combination of oysters, clams, fish heads, assorted meats, sour milk, and insects. This challenge also provided special buckets in case the contestants needed to throw up. The only attraction that I'm aware of in the Orlando area to offer sickness bags aside from, of course, Mission Space in Epcot. The winners of what is possibly the most disgusting thing to ever feature at a theme park would be rewarded for their efforts with a plastic souvenir mug with the words, I ate a bug. But finally, it was time for the grand final of the show, where the remaining two competitors from the previous challenge would compete for the grand prize. The final challenge of Fear Factor Live was the Stuntman's Challenge. This was a race where each competitor would have to climb a ladder on the show's facade, removing several yellow flags as they ascended. Once they reached the top, they had to grab a key and slide down a fireman's pole. From there, they could use the key to start the ignition of their respective yellow Fear Factor live car, which would then ascend into the air. Once they had reached the top of the theatre, they had to climb onto the hood and remove some additional flags. But there was one more- Yeah, we get it already. More guest volunteers controlled several cannons that could shoot balls at the contestants, and the car itself had a sprinkler system installed above it that would make it slippery and difficult to move around on. After retrieving the last flags, they had to climb into the back seat, pick up a rocket launcher, and fire it towards the yellow target in the center of the facade to end the show and be crowned Fear Factor Champion. The Hollywood show was largely the same as the one in Orlando, but with one major difference. Instead of being an industrial back alley, the Hollywood set was reminiscent of an electrical substation, with two large transformers in the background. This was because instead of the finale being the stuntman's challenge, the Hollywood version of the show ended with a finale named Shock and Roll. For this, the two finalists would each have to spin a wheel as fast as they could to make a meter rise, all the while receiving electric shocks through the metal handles of the wheel. Whoever got their meter to the top first would win the show, and the loser would be catapulted away via the bungee cord they were attached to. Reception to Fear Factor Live was about as mixed as with the TV show. While some guests loved the excitement of the show and enjoyed seeing real park guests compete in the challenges they'd seen on TV, others found the show to be too gross for a theme park attraction. After all, a day at Universal Studios was supposed to be a fun day of your vacation, not a brush with scorpions, fish guts, and rancid octopus. Regardless, the world's grossest theme park attraction did receive some attention early on, and provided an opportunity for NBC to advertise their hit show. That was until the following year, when difficulties would start to emerge for the new attraction. In 2006, Fear Factor The Show entered Season 6, but was now facing stiff competition. The show had experienced a sharp decline in ratings, partially due to declining interest from audiences, but also due to the recent success of Fox's newest competition show, American Idol. Season 6 attempted to revitalize the format 
by introducing bigger stunts and a new ending segment sponsored by Capital One credit cards named Fear Factor Home Invasion, where Joe Rogan would show up at the home of Fear Factor viewers, giving them a challenge in exchange for a prepaid $5,000 credit card. But audiences were not impressed by the improved show, or by the prospect of a future podcast host breaking down their door with a bucket full of fish guts, and so only a year after the opening of its two theme park attractions, Fear Factor was cancelled. Universal attempted to keep the attractions going for as long as possible, but without anything to keep it relevant, the Hollywood attractions saw declining popularity, and so by 2008, the show was permanently closed to make way for the Creature from the Black Lagoon musical. However, with the increased space Universal had on the East Coast, the Orlando show actually stuck around well beyond NBC's cancellation of the TV show. Just now there was the awkward scorpion in the room that whenever the producer would introduce the highlight footage from the hit show Fear Factor, it was instead a show that had been cancelled for not being popular enough. In 2011, the TV show was revived by NBC for the new HD era of reality television and was probably cancelled again after only nine episodes. And around this time, the strain started to show for Fear Factor Live. From the get-go, the show had faced several problems. The main one was pretty obvious. A theme park attraction couldn't possibly live up to the ridiculous nature of the TV show. The stunts at Fear Factor Live had to be affordable, repeatable, and importantly, safe. They're clearly safe to an extent on the TV show too, but with a theme park attraction, the contestants have only shown up an hour earlier and are expecting to be wrapped up and ready to move on with their day soon afterwards. So everything has to be really easy for park guests to jump into pretty much immediately. And with three performances a day, every stunt has to be basic enough to reset quickly, in time for the next show. So this severely restricted how dramatic the physical challenges could be. The other mini challenges also had to be very simple, for the same reasons. And they certainly could be a little scary, but mostly they were just kind of gross. Honestly, that's the best way to describe Fear Facts Alive. It wasn't edgy or crazy like the real thing, it was just kind of gross and weird. <laughs> you need to be able to send your park guests about the rest of their day after the show, and so Fear Fact Alive had to be heavily toned down for the Universal audience. And of course, I haven't even mentioned what the grand prize was. So what do you think you get for winning Fear Fact Alive? Was it $50,000? Or maybe a spot on the real show? Was it a lifetime pass to Universal Studios? Uh, no. No, it was none of those things, because the winner of Fear Factor Live would receive a t-shirt. I have heard that apparently in the early days of the show, sometimes guests would win park tickets, but everything I've found online from people that have won themselves shows them receiving a black t-shirt with the words Fear Factor Champion printed on the front. As time went on, the Orlando show suffered from a similar dwindling attendance as in Hollywood, not just with the audience, but with contestants as well. Fear Factor Live was designed for six competitors, just like the real thing, with two being eliminated each round. But from 2012 onwards, the show frequently struggled to reach that number, with many performances featuring four, three, or sometimes just two guests. Because of this, the eel tank relay was often cut from the show, and in the cases with only two contestants, nobody would ever be eliminated. And so it became increasingly hit or miss each time you went, whether you'd actually be able to see the full show. There was also the point that for a lot of the competitors, fear was quite literally not a factor. Because these challenges weren't really the same level as the real thing, you very rarely ever saw any of the hesitation or the fear that was present on TV. The guests that participated had typically all seen the show before, and because the challenges were never different, they all knew exactly what to expect. And it basically just became a weird obstacle course. But still, despite the dwindling popularity, for some reason, Fear Factor Live in Orlando just would not die. Year in and year out, the show stuck around. It even lived long enough to see a third incarnation of the TV show, now hosted by Ludacris on MTV. 
which was of course cancelled after two seasons. With Fear Factor Live outliving that too, it seemed that nothing could bring about an end to this strange time capsule of the early 2000s. I mean, it would have to take some sort of global pandemic to bring about an end to Fear Factor. And when was that ever gonna happen? So, funny story. Alongside many other industries, March 2020 saw theme parks the world over close their doors for an extended period of time as a result of the global pandemic. And when Universal Studios started to open back up again in June of that year, it did so in a limited capacity. Because Fear Factor Live involved guest participation, and especially because of the food challenge, the attraction remained closed during the reopening period with the assumption made that it would once again welcome guests sometime in the following year. Unfortunately though, this was never the case. The following summer, the show still hadn't reopened, and in October 2021, more than 15 years after the original TV show had gone off the air, Universal announced that Fear Factor Live would be closing permanently. Unlike in Hollywood, there was no announcement of what would replace it. Initially, Universal had planned to demolish the theatre soon after the official closing, and there were very loose rumours flying around that the space would be used to expand the next door Diagon Alley, potentially to include some sort of VR Harry Potter ride. But in February 2022, it was discovered by Alicia Stella of Orlando Park Stop that this demolition plan had been cancelled, presumably to free up more space for the construction of Epic Universe. And since then, there's been no sign that Universal has any plans to use the space. This attraction has been on my radar for a while, but researching this video recently, I was really struck by just how similar the tale of Fear Factor Live is to another Orlando attraction, the American Idol experience. Of course, that's an attraction that's been covered very well by Defunct Land, so I don't have any immediate plans to take a look at it myself, but in my opinion, the story of the rise and fall is very much the same. Both of these are shows that struggled with the difficulty of trying to recreate reality TV in a sanitized, repeatable way, offering lesser prizes really only intended to sell an illusion, because you're never going to be able to fully recreate that reality experience. They also both suffered by opening towards the end of their respective show's run of popularity, and both had this awkward existence advertising something that most people didn't really care about anymore. I only ever saw Fear Factor live in person one time when I was quite young, but even then I think I was still put off by just how weird and gross so much of it was. Today, Fear Factor Live lies dormant, its sign haphazardly covered up, and the theatre sitting in a semi-abandoned state. A sad reminder of the time when eating bugs was a selling point at Universal Studios. What did you think about Fear Factor Live? Did you ever see it in person? And do you have any hopes for what Universal will do with the space next? Let me know in the comments. Apart from that, new videos about theme parks are always coming in the future, and as always, I'll see you next time.